Hey guys, welcome to our final part in our video series on the preliminaries for recursive macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to talk about the theorem of a maximum. Let's go. So what is the theorem of a maximum and what is it useful for? One of the things that we want to establish from our contraction mappings is that if we put a continuous function f into our operator t, the resulting function t of f will be continuous as well. Bottom line, this is important because this means our policy function derived from t of f will be continuous as well. Uh, bringing this back to the context of economics, we want to define the next period capital K for all levels of current period capital K, and we want our capital accumulation to be defined across all current levels of capital. So this is just a technicality because we don't want a situation where we have our capital stock or our capital accumulation in the next period to be defined uh, for some values and not others. So in terms of the problems that we're analyzing, define h of x as the partial maximization problem of f of x and y. Notice how h is a function of x, so we're optimizing with respect to y. So this function h is a function that produces an optimum given a value x as determined by maximizing f of x and y with respect to y. Define now g of x, right, which is defined as the set of all choices y that obtain a maximum f given the state x. That is, g of x is the state of all of these maximization arguments that could possibly exist for each y. Informally, we can say h of x is a partially maximized f of x y function, and g of x gives us a set of maximized values with respect to x. So in terms of giving a formal definition for our theorem of a maximum, I'm just going to read this here because I think just reading this will go and further drive the point home to your memory. Let x be a subset of our real number space L, and y be a subset of a real number space in dimension M. Let f of x and y map to some R, right, so be a continuous function, and let this gamma correspondence between x and y be compact value and a continuous correspondence. Then h of x to R is continuous, and g of x which is our feasibility set, which maps x to y, is non-empty, compact value, and upper hemi-continuous. So um, the hardest part of this definition is the idea of this concept of upper hemi-continuous. So we don't really know uh, what this is. So the best way to proceed is by defining what upper hemi-continuity is and what lower hemi-continuity is as well. So for a formal definition of lower hemi-continuity, the correspondence gamma, which maps x to y, is lower hemi-continuous at x, right, at a point x, if gamma here is non-empty, so this is by construction there. And for two, for every y uh, in our constraint set, gamma x, and every sequence, right, as x of n approaches x, right, so as we take each x term, right, we can asymptotically approach x. There exists some index n, which is greater than zero, and a sequence uh, yn, where n is goes from this index n to infinity, such that yn up goes to y. And yn is contained in our uh, feasibility set as a function of x of n for all n greater than n. In terms of defining upper hemi-continuity, which is important for our definition, a compact valued correspondence gamma, which maps x to y, is upper hemi continuous at x if gamma x is non empty. And for every sequence xn, which goes to x, right, that means for each, uh, each point x that goes to x, right, we have that sequence. And every sequence yn, such that yn is contained in our feasibility set where gamma is evaluated at x for all n, there exists a convergent subsequence of y whose limit point is also in gamma x. So we have to keep these definitions in mind for actually understanding what they mean. So let's look at an example. So in terms of visualizing upper and lower hemi-continuity, it's best to go and talk about it around different points. So we're talking about areas around these points. So we can say that our correspondence is lower hemi-continuous at x0. This is because our correspondence is non-empty and our xn is defined as it approaches x0, meaning that we can take an infinite sequence approaching x0 
uh, from both sides and x naught will be there. And our second of our second points is that we can identify an index uh, n being greater than one such that we can start this sequence uh, y n from a certain n such that y n right which is this sequence of points uh, asymptotically approaches the y naught and y n is contained in our correspondence set for all capital n greater than our little n here our correspondence however is not upper hemi continuous at x naught because there exists a sequence of y n such that y n is contained in x but its limits point is not in y so um the best way to do this i'm just gonna do this over here so i'm gonna draw a little point here if we were going to have one of these guys here um and we were to go and asymptotically approach it over here right i'm just drawing a really terrible arrow with my mouse but you won't be able to approach that point from that sequence right so it's not defined across all values within our correspondence so let's talk about point x number one our correspondence is not lower hemi continuous at point x1 uh, this is because we can find some y n that is not contained in our constraint set so let's say we're considering in the area over here just drawing a little circle and uh we were to take a point um that would asymptotically uh go and approach it we can find points that are outside of our constraint set that will approach uh that point that point denoted by that green little dot over there our correspondence is upper hemi continuous at x1 because our correspondence is not empty and we can find a corresponding subsequence that is in uh, our constraint set gamma x so uh, that's the end of our series on our preliminaries for recursive macroeconomics let me know what you think if you have any questions like always leave them in the comments below i'll see what i can do take care